The Way of the Warrior and the Visitor, Homefront and Paradise Lost, Starship Down, and Little Green Men. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we are doing a review of the entirety of Deep Space Nine Season 4. Man, there are so many good... Just just listing those few episodes was hard to narrow it down to just six. How are you today, <laughs> Sirach? Narrow it down to six. That's a, that's a wide narrow down. <laughs> Well, you know, for the other season premieres, I just say like three or four, you know, interesting titles or fun episodes. But I just found out of the first like 13 or 14 episodes, there were like six that needed to be almost all of these. Just a super quick rundown. The Way of the Warrior, The Visitor, Hippocratic Oath, Indiscretion, Rejoined, Starship Down, Little Green Men, The Sword of Kalis, Our Man Bashir, Homefront, Paradise Lost, Crossfire, Return to Grace, Sons of Moog, Bar Association, Ascension, sorry, Accession, Rules of Engagement, Hard Time, Shattered Mirror, The Muse, For the Cause, To the Death, The Quickening, Body Parts, and Broken Link. That's like wow. a who's who of great episodes. That's a lot of great episodes. Um, <clears throat> this is a great season of, of Deep Space Nine. And the the thing that jumps out to me right away is the fact that I remember more of these episodes than I do the ones of previous seasons. Like right away, yeah, it jumps out to me a lot of these episodes. So yep. the names have attached and and it's it's burnt an impression on me enough to where I can recognize it easily. Yeah, me too, completely. Like I recognized every one of these. Uh, whereas in previous seasons, we're kind of like, which one was this? And kind of we, we fumble through a few of them, like two or three per season. But this one, I think partly is because we just reviewed this season like a year ago, a year and a half to a year ago. So it's fresher in our minds, but also they, they just kind of stepped it up. You know, this is when Worf joined. So, you know, things kind of built up, you know, Cisco got his goatee and shaved head. Uh, the Defiant had just already been introduced. Like suddenly Deep Space Nine had grown and season four, I think was kind of its coming out party, it seems. I agree. I agree. Maybe it's because uh, we, we, we finally got to know all the characters at this point mm. and there's enough of storylines kind of built up on each character that um, it just feels like I've gotten to know everybody and this is also the first season that Worf comes on, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yep. Right? Exactly. Right. So that's another added kind of bonus. He, he does, uh, you know, just bring another layer of context and texture to the cast. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember this season is it's starting to become more relevant and, and important to me as far as the stakes. You know what else it is? Uh... And I'd forgotten this till just now, and I just checked uh, as well. Is that this was the first season after the next generation ended, which means that all the suits and all the the eye of Sauron, the eye of CBS, had shifted its focus from next generation Deep Space Nine, even though it was never really watching Deep Space Nine as much, into Voyager. And the new show. And I do remember the writers and the producers mentioning this before, where once Voyager was going to be the new show and they shifted all their focus onto that, it kind of gave the writers of Deep Space Nine free reign to just do whatever they wanted. Like they weren't, you know, the, the, the suits weren't, weren't micromanaging or weren't watching them. And so they can just kind of get as creative as they wanted. And I think this is evidence of that. And this, the first half of this season, was the only time that there weren't that it wasn't sharing time with another show. So uh, yeah, the first half of this season is it's all you. <laughs> yeah, but as you know, there's a lot of preparation that goes yep. when you're launching a new show. So even though we weren't on air with anybody, Voyager was still uh, in the works mm -hmm. and 
you know, a lot of things were getting done behind uh, um, the scene. Right. And that's why all the suits were watching Voyager and letting Deep Space Nine and, and Ira and Robert and them just do their Plus, worst. Uh, Paramount was busy creating the whole UPN network at that time, too. So there was a lot structurally going on as far as, uh, you know, the entire uh, organization. So a lot of the things were kind of flying under the radar at that moment because they were shuffling around. Right. And uh, Next Generation had its movie First Contact coming out as well. Anyway, lots of lots and lots of stuff. Feels like a trip down memory lane. Ah, oh, those were the good old days. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's do an episode breakdown rundown, I should say. I, I don't know how we're going to get through all these because they're all so great. Uh, it starts with The Way of the Warrior, which is just. It's one of the most quotable episodes, uh, two parters in Star Trek history. In my opinion, this is where some of the best lines come from. This is when, uh, you know, Worf shows up and, you know, there's, there's just so many, so much good stuff. You know, it's, it's a real kickoff to season four. What are some of those, uh, lines like are an example? I no, no. <laughs> not the top of the head. <laughs> yeah, this is. What I do. I'm this, trying to this remember. This is the, the beginning of Worf, though. So this is Worf, right? Yes. I mean, the first episode with him. This is when they're fighting the Klingons, right. and they bring on Worf to help right. them. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not the prune juice line, right? <laughs> no, but see, uh, okay, so. One of the scenes, oh, there's so many. And when I'm watching the episode, I recognize it. Uh, for example, my favorite scene and what I think is the best scene in the history of Star Trek is in this episode. This is the one with, and you're close with the root, with the prune juice thing. It's the root beer one with Garrick and Quark talking about how root beer is, is so cloy and disgusting and they're like, but you kind of get used to it just like the Federation. It's this really great scene. Um, I'd have to start watching the show to remember when right. these lines are coming up. Uh, it's also, I believe, when my favorite wharf line possibly is when he gets that old Klingon drunk to get information from him. Um, yeah. And he says, and the old drunk guy's like, have I ever told you about your father, whatever? And then Worf says, yes, many times. And he says, it is a good story. And Worf goes, yes, and you tell it well, but I, and then he goes into it. And I'm just like, I love that. Yes, and you tell it well. Like, it's like Klingon etiquette to say yes, and you tell the story well. Like, that's half the story is how yeah. you tell it. Such good stuff there. <laughs> it also means I've heard it before. <laughs> let's move on yeah uh okay speaking of moving on we could talk about the way of the warrior all day which we have so everybody go check out that review because man and it's a two-parter again consistent with uh, uh ds9's theme of of you know starting the season off on a two-parter yep um so they're they're keeping that part consistent yep the next episode is a little episode called The Visitor. No big deal. Just one of the greatest episodes in Star Trek history. Some would say the best. Uh, oh, yeah. How Visitor. well do you remember that one still? I, it's, you know, it's amazing. It's just mm -hmm. still impactful. Um, it's always going to be um, connected emotionally to a lot of things for me. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. This was also kind of a um, uh, big Jake centric, Cisco father and son centric episode too, which mm -hmm. was really uh, special to see, especially done in this kind of way. When you had those episodes like the Explorers, uh, I think last season. Yeah. Uh, when you have those moments where you get to see the bonding between father and son or just the, the connection between them. I think it's special. And that's, that's why this, this episode will always be impactful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The most recent time watching this episode was for me was when we just did this review a year and a half ago. And 
I definitely liked it more this most recent time than ever before when I, I, I fully realized it that just the anguish that must go through also from the father's point of view, watching his son grow old and not wanting to see his son wasted. I mean, there's just that whole point of view is like, it's so impactful. Um, anyway, one of the best episodes ever. Everybody knows it. And if they don't, they're not alive. They are, they, they're <laughs> zombies. Okay. Episode three is Hippocratic Oath. Bashir is asked to help a group of renegade Jem Hadar break their addiction to Ketracel White. Meanwhile, Worf is dissatisfied with the way Odo runs security. I remember that Worf is kind of like bickering with Odo and kind of nitpicking, be like, that is not the way it should be done, or whatever he says. You know, and <laughs> Odo's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. and uh, Bashir and O'Brien were actually on that planet trying to help the Jem Hadar, and it has like, they go down in a blaze of glory of fighting and killing and pretty important episode. Yeah. It was a good episode. Yep. And then moving on um, to, Oh, I thought, <laughs> I, know, I, thought no, I didn't have much more to add to it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I just remember that, you know, the idea of the catcher cell white is just such a heavy idea, especially when you talk about uh, people drugging, uh, dealing with drug addiction in this yeah. country how it's um, you know increasingly becoming the number one cause of death um, and so there's it's a very tangible story because it's something that is current and that we're all dealing with in some way or another either directly or indirectly through friends or family members so um, yeah breaking addiction man it, that's something that is always going to be uh, a, a tough subject to tackle and, and deal with mm -hmm. especially how sinister it was that the the uh, dominion created this race already addicted to catch cell white is it's horrible right. um so and then episode four is indiscretion uh kira and gul dukat go after the lost prison ship ravenock dukat has a secret meanwhile cassidy yates tries to find work near bajor leaving cisco uncomfortable now, I believe this one, yes, this was story by Tony Marbury and Jack Trevino, our good pals. And did we have them on the show to review that? Um, I feel like we did. Yes, we did have the, the writers, Jack Trevino and Tony Marbury on for this one. Always great to see them. And always great. Yeah. We what learn a, a little bit more about uh, Ducat and we meet Zial, right? Yeah. And that kind of adds a whole nother layer to Ducat and makes you kind of, uh, I guess it's a, a certain level of vulnerability for him. It exposes a certain level of vulnerability where he seemed to be a hardened guy with no no um weaknesses or entry points into him and this this kind of <laughs> into his thoughts uh but this seemed to be a vehicle for them to you know uh give us a different side of the ducat mm -hmm. um okay then we've got rejoined lenara khan the host of the wife of Dax's former host, Tarias, comes to the station. While they're not allowed to renew their relation, there's still a spark. By the way, directed by Avery Brooks, this was the one that kind of, you know, everybody says had the first lesbian kiss or same sex kiss on Star Trek. I don't know if it's necessarily considered lesbian with uh trills because they have both genders you know like they're kind of a gender in in some way at least the uh symbiont is uh but it was still it was one of these big moments in television history because this is back in the 90s and so it was definitely a big moment yeah a very big moment and i i think i can remember uh, avery saying that you know, there was a lot of interest in people 
wanting to be around for this moment because it was such really? a historical moment. Yes. And, um, you know, wh wh when we did certain episodes, there was an electricity and a certain kind of vibration where people caught wind of things and they wanted to be around for the moment. So, for example, well, far beyond the stars, there were so many people on the set coming to visit the set, executives, mm -hmm. other people. Um, Probably take me out to the Hall of Suite. Yes. Well, yes, to some degree, but maybe they just wanted to get outside. On, <laughs> yeah, that was on location. So this, <laughs> people couldn't just leave their office and come down and see the set. Right. Yeah. Um, but in certain area, uh, you know, certain times people would want to see it because they knew it was a historical time. Tri another example is tri trials and tribulations, right? When they had the yes. trials. I remember you talking and, about that, how everybody, everybody was buzzing about it. Yeah. So everybody and their mom was down at that set. Uh, you know, <laughs> everybody had their family, everybody, whoever could get there, got there. And um, with Rejoined, the same kind of energy was kind of buzzing around this this moment because it was going to be such a historical moment and you know this intimacy between Dex and this woman playing um former host wife mm -hmm. um but Avery called for a closed set and said no we're not going to make this a public display and we're going to keep this private so that's that's the story makes sense Makes sense. He doesn't want to make a spectacle of it. These ladies are professional actors trying to get the job done and they don't need a bunch of people leering and gawking for a historic moment, even if it is, you know, out of the best of intentions. Um, they can't, right. they, he wants them to not be distracted and to be able to focus on a, a which is because it was a very intimate moment and it would be very hard to act out a very intimate moment in a very unintimate setting. Uh, so next was episode yeah. six, uh, another one of my favorites and, and a very memorable one for me. You know, I, I remember it very vividly from first watch 20 years ago or whatever it was. Starship Down, a damaged defiant, defiant ship, a damaged defiant must play a dangerous game of cat and mouse with two Jem'Hadar ships inside a gas giant. Now, the reason this one was so memorable to me is that it had so many memorable images. You know, like the imagery was very memorable to me, one of which was when Quark and I forgot the alien's name, the uh, uh, Gamma Quadrant alien that is played by my pal, love the dude, James Cromwell. Uh, and they're, remember, negotiating. And first the guy's like, no, we're not going to do it. But then they end up gambling. There, there's like the torpedo that gets stuck in the Defiant. And then they gamble, yeah. they kind of gamble and say, just pull one and see what happens. And the guy gets super exhilarated because it works. And he ends up saying, okay, right. I'll work with you guys. And then there's also uh, there's also Bashir and Dax being stuck. Uh, there's also in, in like the turbo lift or whatever it was. Oh, yeah. There's also Wharf. Kind of, oh, that's not it. Wharf, uh, that's a Hulu advertisement, but they don't pay us, so we skip that. Um, this is when there, there's the two engineers also that, that need to be kind of slapped on the butt and said, you know, Wharf says, good job, eventually. Um, but then right. The, right. the other very memorable thing, and then sorry, I know I'm saying a lot, but there's a lot to this episode, was when Cisco gets injured and Kira is trying to keep him alive by talking to him and keeping him distracted and, and conscious. And he's like, basically, he's like, calls her out. He's like, you're always talking about work, you know, stop talking about work. And so we get to hear her open up and then she breaks down and she says, and, and the, the acting by Nana is phenomenal there where she says, I don't know what to do anymore. I don't know what, you know, and she says, I'm just going to pray for you because I don't know what to do. And the way she delivered that, I remember it's like, gives you chills, mm -hmm. uh, but lots of very memorable little pockets of plots. Oh, when you tell it like that, I remember the, I remember it uh, vividly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I second a lot of the things she just said. I remember that torpedo getting stuck in there. That was kind of a big, Awesome. Burnt into my mind. 
kind of thing. Um, and I also do remember that very good scene between Cisco and Kira where they're, where, you know, where he needs to be kind of kept conscious and she's doing her best to talk to him. Um, mm -hmm. Great moment there. Yeah. Uh, there, there are just like four or five, you know, it's like, it was like a plot, B plot, C plot, D plot, possibly an E plot, you know, but every one of them was powerful and memorable in its own way. And I don't remember ever seeing an episode that had that many strings of separate plots. I, I just love that one. Love, love, love it. And uh, we also, by the way, had the writers of that episode join us, David Mack and John Ordover. If you recall them, very fun, great guys. Uh, and it was really cool talking with them about that. Yeah, that was, uh, and that, and, and that alien that was, uh, dealing uh, that scene with Quark, I, yeah. great makeup. Job. That's your, is that the Cromwell, uh, yeah. James Cromwell, the character's Cromwell. name was, let me look him up. Hanok. Hanok. How I could remember. I forget Hanok? How memorable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. All right. So next how are we going to get through all these? Next is another extremely memorable episode, Little Green Men. Quark and Rom <laughs> take Nog to Earth and Starfleet Academy, but a malfunction with the ship takes the crew back in time to Roswell, New Mexico, 1947. Those old ship malfunctions. This, this is another one that's like, nobody yeah. forgets this one. Nobody goes, which one is that? Yeah, that's uh, it's great because it ties into what everybody suspects about the Roswell crash and everything. Mm. I mean, it's it's so clever, cleverly done. Um, they also, I remember this episode. They were nobody else could understand them. They could understand each other, but everybody else couldn't understand uh, the thingy when they were talking to each other. Then they got the universal translator. I, I, that was a it was a great episode, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, and didn't we have Ira on for this episode? No, close though. You you were very close. Uh, this was another one. Just three episodes ago was the first one written by Jack Trevino and Tony Marbury. Just three, four episodes later, we've got Jack and Tony wrote this episode as well or got story by credits. Tony was not able to join us, but Jack was. So that is the presence that you remember. And he, I believe he basically said what we all would have expected, which is the pitch went as quickly and easily as this. What if the Ferengi land on <laughs> Earth in Roswell, New Mexico, 1947? And the producer's like, sold. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Got it. Yes. 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 Brilliant idea. Let's do it. Right. I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. That's uh <laughs> It's a no-brainer there. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, yeah, Jack 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 Trevino is such a kind guy and such a wonderful man, and um, so thoughtful, and and was very generous to share his time with us and kind of break down these episodes. And yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he's, he, he's just as impressionable as as the episodes that he's written. Yeah, and he's been super nice to our supporters as well. Remember, he's he and Tony. Uh, autographed the cover right. uh, page of both of their scripts multiple times for our associate producers and supporters. Really, really great people. Really appreciate them. Um, yeah. So shout out to them. The next one is The Sword of Kaelas. Oh, and by the way, amazing acting by Aaron Eisenberg, uh, Max Gredenchik, yeah. Armin Shimmerman, and also, uh, you know, Rene Aubergine and all the other people. Great acting in that episode. Really loved it. The Sword of Kaelas, Worf, Dax, and the, Dahar, and the Klingon Dahar Master, Kor, set out to find an ancient lost relic, the Sword of Kaelas. This is more of a Ciroc episode than a Ryan episode because you like those, uh, what are those, what are those kind of things called? You know, like the Indiana Jones type, the treasure hunt ones where they're climbing through the caves and figuring things right. out. It's a fun one though. Yeah, I do like those Tomb Raider type of things. And uh, <laughs> yeah. this was this was the Klingon episode. You're going to get a lot of fighting, a lot of roughing. 
I like the fact that um, Dax was able to hold her own in this episode and kind of, if I'm not mistaken, she was kind of holding her own and amongst the uh, the Klingons. Um, but I just, uh, the only thing I remember, because I, when I was growing up, um, you know, the Klingons did eventually get into business and they opened the K-Less shoe store. So, thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I believe, and I'll pull it up in a second. I believe there are memes that say that, which is great. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Like, here's one. I'll pull that up before we hit our commercial right quick. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <K-less shoe> source. <laughs> yeah, excellent see that's when you know Sirach, uh, that you've got a great idea is when like it's confirmed because the, the yeah. internet agrees with you um they think that 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 is deserving of yeah, a meme <laughs> of the work that it took to make that also that episode was directed by lavar burton so up next is episode nine but we will do that on the other side we're going to take a super quick break And we'll be right back on the seventh rule. (laughs) All right, everybody. We are back on the seventh rule with, you guessed it, Ciroc Lofton. Yes, sir. We are having fun and uh, just taking a walk down memory lane through all of season four. And we are on episode nine, Our Man Bashir. When a transporter emergency turns the command crew into hollow sweet characters, Bashir's James Bond fantasy takes on a deadly reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know this is the one where you're like, oh, a hollow sweet. I don't know. But as soon as it says James Bond, you're like, OK, yeah. I know this one. Uh, we actually had Alexander Siddig join us for this review. He was very gracious with his time. Super fun. This is another one of those episodes where you're kind of like you're taken out of the, the normal star trek episode and put into something kind of fun and different and super creative yeah and that's one thing that they blend on this show is a little bit of uh the seriousness right the cruelty of life the hardness of war you know the occupation and the residuals of the effects of that so they go through all of that but then they also give you episodes like little green men episodes like our man bashir that allow you to kind of suspend belief for a little bit and have these same characters that you already know put in very unusual and unique circumstances that are not going to happen, but are good for us uh, for television and good for totally. storytelling and for fa- and for fantasy, right? So yeah. this is this is more like the fantasy aspect of of science of sci-fi which i like wait till you see a next generation and the key is always like either (laughs) uh hollow sweet program or mysterious alien slash q puts them in a strange position or situation uh this one was really fun especially because no offense to all the others but we get to see avery brooks play a bad guy and it was glorious. Yeah. And he was wearing that super sharp suit, you know, Ugh, glorious. Yes, I loved him as the bad guy. And um, you know, even though some of those episodes are kind of corny and the, oh, yeah. you kind of just you just smile because it's it's, you know, you're, you're going along for the ride. Mm-hmm. But it was good to see him play this bad guy because he finally got a chance to step outside of Cisco's role and and play something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is looking sharp. That's slick right there. Yeah. That's this nice outfit. All right. So next (laughs) was, oh boy, this is where it starts getting even crazier. Episode 10, Homefront. This is the first of the two parters, which was Homefront and episode two was Paradise Lost, continuing their tradition, Deep Space Nine's tradition of having two parters with different names. Uh, so Homefront was Cisco travels to Earth when a bombing at a Federation conference is determined to be the work of changelings and Paradise Lost went, oh, this is so good. This is when we get to see 
uh, Joseph Cisco and then the, the Cisco family and all that. And then Nog visits you guys uh, over at mm -hmm. uh, the Creole house or what was, what was it called? Like Joseph's place or something. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, great episode. Uh, yeah. Yes. I think it's Cisco's Creole kitchen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great episodes. And these episodes kind of reminded me because, you know, if I'm not mistaken, when we went on this uh, tour, one of the locations was used in yep in this uh, in these one of these two part episodes, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the uh, this is my I swear yeah. the Cisco family of especially the three of you, grandfather, father, okay. and son, and the 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 camaraderie that you guys share and it felt so real watching it like watching yeah. it just it almost brings a tear to your eye just seeing like the three of you genuinely felt like you cared about each other and it really worked on the show like more than any family or relationship for me personally in any star trek series is that one and so just even yeah. just seeing that still frame of you know hugging father and son hugging i'm just like oh my god it's the greatest thing in the world um but yes, uh, we did go visit at the uh, Voyager documentary away missions. We went to the Japanese gardens, which, which was used as Starfleet headquarters. Uh, all of the exterior shots at Starfleet headquarters were shot there. We got to go around and check that place out, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, and also the thing that I, I remember kind of just kind of sticks out is the moment when Cisco um, is suspicious that his that Joseph is uh, that his dad is a changeling, yes. right? And I remember this this the verbal tongue lashing that he gave his that he gave Benjamin like, you know, how dare you? You know, your mind's lost. You you know, you're questioning me, your own father. You know, and I, I remember that moment. Um, being impactful because it was one of the moments where you you get to see very rarely the fact uh, where Benjamin Sisko is himself the child, right? He's an adult, but he's still the child in some moments. And and that and in these episodes, you get to see his father remind him that he's his child, which I kind of like that dynamic as well. It adds more context to who Sisko is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he really, Joseph Sisko for that minute there was, was a legitimate freedom fighter. Uh, and I can hear his voice hit like the calmness, the calm and the soothingness of his voice, but it delivered sternly like right. where he was just like, now, hang on a second. Like this is, I am not going to do this. And, and you get this from older people a lot of times that have like, you know, quote, seen some shit and lived their lives where they're like, I'm not, I'm really not interested in sugarcoating this. <laughs> I'm just, <Right. laughs> I'm, I'm too old. I'm too old to say this nicely. I am not going to do this. And y'all need to, well, I don't care how many of you there are and how many phasers you have. I'm not right. going to comply. Uh, God can't get enough of that guy brock peters oh by the way there's i, I watched recently a documentary where um it was a nuclear reactor site i want to say chernobyl yeah. where there are people that are still living there that were asked to leave and they're like no i'm not i'm not leaving yes. and to that up uh, to that point where there's just some people older usually older people who are just they're just locked in and they're like nope I'm going to die right here. I don't care if it's radiated. Yeah. I don't care if there's no power, I, whatever. I'll just live here. And yes, some that, that was Chernobyl. Yeah, there are definitely some people that are still there. And yeah. they're basically going to have to be removed by force. I remember seeing a documentary of a lady that lives in Siberia in Russia. And she's basically like the most isolated person on the planet. She has one neighbor who's a guy that lives like you know, a mile down the hill or two miles down the hill or something, but mm -hmm. there are no cities or villages anywhere near them. And they're just out in the snow and the mountains. And they're like, dude, 
you're an old lady, you need medical attention, you need people to watch over you. And they're just like, whatever. I'm just going to go keep chopping wood. <laughs> That's what I do. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> what do you eat? Just bread, I guess. I don't know. She just, uh, anyway. So, I mean, those people, once they've set in their life and they, I'm sure they figured it out, but you know, there's just people that are set in their ways. And to me, that was one of the, the things Joseph Cisco was in this episode. He was like, I don't care who's a change link and what. And what I'm your father, and you're mm -hmm. not gonna tell me that I gotta subject to this. Right. He was like, and, I've and got was, my I know my rights kind of thing. I know my rights. Right. I don't owe you anything. And you know, I've got my dignity, and I'm gonna tell you I'm not a changeling, and that's that. Obviously, his son is now put in a difficult position to where he's like, Well, yeah, but everybody would say that <laughs> that was a changeling. <laughs> like, I get it, but also. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a great one it was, it was so good because yeah. you could see all the angles there uh yeah. next one was crossfire first minister shakakar visits the Shukakar. station despite the threat of assassination he falls in love with kira much to odo's dismay this episode is just an episode that furthers along the the story the ballad of kira and odo and this is when Kira, you know, starts to fall for Shakar and Odo starts to harumph a little bit more. Yeah. Doesn't Shakar, is it Shakar that has the, a lot of uh, nams? Yes. Or what? It is yeah. Shakar. Yeah. Shakar is the most, it has the craziest ratio of non-appearance mentions to appearances. He currently, to this day, has 14 non-appearance mentions as in mentioned in an episode that he did not appear in but he only has a total of three actual physical appearances which is just <laughs> and this is and this is one of them right this yeah. is okay one of the three yeah they've um they've they tried and failed to, to give uh kira a love interest that's equal to her energy and her you know her Right. Magnificent. So it's it's hard to find somebody to pair her with. And all of those guys kind of fell short. Even, you know, you saw Burial, you see Shikar, you're like, mm, yeah, he's he's all right. But mm -hmm. uh, he's no he's no Odo. <laughs> Spoken like the true Jake Sisko in that one episode in the third season where everybody falls in love with each other and you fell in love with Kira. So, of course, you're going to think nobody. Oh, he's not good. What you need yeah. is a 17 year old. Oh, yeah. boy, oh boy, I'll show you. <laughs> I can take care of us. <laughs> uh, speaking of taking care of us, the next one is episode 13, Return to Grace. Ducat returns, stripped of his prestige, to escort Kira to a Cardassian conference about the Dominion. But an attack by Klingon Raider may give Ducat a chance to redeem himself in the eyes of his government. Directed by, by the way, Jonathan West. Yeah. who's the dp yeah yeah uh, uh, <laughs> but like yeah yeah this is one well, that just I, furthers ducat's storyline yeah yeah i can't remember too much from this episode i kind of have to watch it again to to really get fresh with the scenes but i can say this i love the back and forth between ducat and kira Always. so this has to have great moments where he's kind of coming on to her and she's making him feel like nothing. So I'm glad that, you know, I, I don't remember the specifics of the episode, but overall their chemistry is priceless. Yes. And also uh, Zial was involved in this episode. So I think this may have been when he ends up leaving Zial with Kira, if I'm not mistaken, maybe I am mistaken. Oh, okay. Maybe that's the next episode with Zial. But uh, anyway, this was, that was also a great storyline was the Ducat Kira Zial dynamic, very, right. very important, very creative, very poignant one. Uh, however, next we have the sons of Moog. Worf's brother Kern asks him to perform a death rite to regain his lost honor. Meanwhile, Kira and O'Brien investigate Klingon activity near the Bajoran border, directed by David Livingston. Uh, what I mainly remember about this one, my takeaway from it was that we had the discussion about where does 
acceptance and tolerance for somebody's culture end and enforcement of your own laws and culture begin. And this was when Worf attempted to kill his brother because his brother asked him to. And in Klingon culture, that's okay. And Cisco was like, you tried to kill somebody on my station <laughs> and you're supposed to be my security officer or my tactical officer. And so there's that weird gray area there where it's like, Worf is just doing something that is perfectly normal and honorable and beautiful in his culture. And Cisco is aghast by this. He's like, no, you can't just kill people <laughs> on my station. Yeah. Um, it also deals with the issue of kind of like uh, assisted killings that hold Jack of Orkian type yes. of thing. Right. Uh, where people, you know, if people want to die, is it okay to kill them if they, if mm -hmm. they're requesting it, you know? And, and so these are kinds of really big issues. I, I like how DS9 takes on issues like this. And even though there is no real right or wrong, they, they put those kinds of questions up for the viewer to, to think about, you know, um, about certain circumstances. There's always, for example, exceptions to rules when you come up with certain rules. It's like, well, nobody can do this unless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's always the unless. There's right. always so, the unless. So, you know. The, nobody can the travel kind of with the basketball unless you're James Harden. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think that um, it's, it's just consistent with how DS9 tackles issues like this. And I remember from this episode, definitely the anger that Cisco had with, yes. with uh, Worf. He was very disappointed in him. And I think that was kind of the thing I walked away with the most was Cisco's disappointment and also discipline that he had for Worf, right? Those mm -hmm. are the things that I, I remember. Yeah, really good episode because of that, because they bring up this question that I don't really know if it has an answer. It's kind of a Rorschach test of the answer depends on who's looking at it. You know, some people might look at it and say, well, obviously they should be able to fill in the blank. And other people might look at it and say, well, obviously they can't fill in the blank, you know? It's really interesting. And I love that Deep Space Nine doesn't ever try to like force feed you the answer. They just try to present the question and let us think about it. And I just, I love it because that's something I'm, I can think about forever because I don't know the answer. Um, and you did bring up the, the Kevorkian type uh, assisted killing thing in that in our yeah. review as well. And it's really, really good points there. Next was bar association, unfair working conditions and pay cuts caused Rom to organize a union of employees of Quark's bar. Meanwhile, Worf still finds it hard to settle on the station. I believe this was Chase Masterson's third episode as Lita. Cause I remember thinking, okay, now she's really starting to get, you know, ensconced and built into the storylines and the plots. And, you know, this is when uh, Rom kind of finds his voice. And I think Lita gives him a peck on the cheek for being such a union superstar. Uh, but this was yeah. obviously the big union episode on Deep Space Nine. And it was actually the big uh, union between Rom and Lita. Oh, right. <laughs> That's right. Like, we did mention that. Yeah. yeah. This is kind of their the beginning of their budding romance. Um, I like this episode. Um, there were a lot of reasons, but particularly because... Um, Nog makes the case that he wants to join Starfleet prior to this because he doesn't want to be anything like his father. Right. And that sends to me a signal that his father ha was kind of uh, spineless prior to this. He didn't have the, you know, the fortitude to stand up to his brother, stand up for himself. And to me, this begins his journey of standing up for himself. Uh, this bar association is him yeah. standing up to court. And I like that because this, this Rom is a, becomes a Rom that Nog could be proud of. He's on the beginning of, 
his path now to becoming the Rom that Nog could say, yeah, that's my dad, as opposed to, I don't want to be anything like my dad. So I, That's a I really that's... great point, uh, because in previous episodes, Rom would stand up to Quark and then wither. He would be like, right. oh, brother, I don't think that. And Quark would say, all right, then I'll dock your pay. Okay, you know, whatever. Whatever it was, but this was the first time he he actually physically took that stand and put his money where his mouth was, uh, and yeah, we did notice the the correlation of forming a union, you know, in the traditional sense, but also mm-hmm. forming a union between Rom and Lita. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next one. Oh wait, let me check to see. Did we have any guests there? Uh, Yes, for Bar Association, I thought so. We did have Chase Masterson there. Uh, Chase Masterson, who played Lita, she's amazing. We love her, and she's always yeah. unbelievably gracious with her time. Two episodes prior to that, uh, we had Una McCormack join us for Return to Grace because she is, uh, you know, she's a Star Trek book writer, novelist, and she's also basically like the expert on Cardassian. So she was really great to have for us there. And then also in Crossfire uh, with uh, First Minister Shakar, if you'll recall, we did have Duncan Regeer join us who plays Shakar. Yes. We had to, we had to get him quick because he only got actually three episodes that he's actually physically in the show. So he was amazing <laughs> with his yeah. time as well. Forgot to mention all of those. Um, so where yeah. are we next? We are uh, now, at we are a session. hard time No, a, a session. session. Yeah. And so okay. a session, let me pull that up. Uh, yeah, we were really fortunate with all the people that joined us there. Duncan Regeer, great guy. He was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so a session, a man claiming to be the emissary comes through the wormhole. Cisco is happy to give up his position. Meanwhile, Keiko returns, finally, and O'Brien stops spending time with Bashir, directed by everybody's favorite, Les Landau. Uh, Okay, so this was the guy that basically said, I'm the emissary and you're not. And Cisco's like, cool, you can have it. But then ends up having a change of heart. All right. Yeah. I remember it. (laughs) Yeah, me too. I remember it. So then there was episode 18. <laughs> uh, now, that was an interesting one, a fun one, but there's not a ton really to, to say about that one. It was, it was good. It was interesting. And it was good to see that change in Cisco. That's when I think he finally embraced becoming the emissary and said, you know what? Actually, you're not the emissary. I am. Um, yeah. But the next one is rules of engagement. Now, rules of engagement is when Worf destroys a civilian shuttle during an engagement with the Klingons. An extradition hearing is held to see if he must face charges. This is another one directed by LeVar Burton. It's like his third or fourth one this season. Um, This is definitely more of a Ciroc episode, I think. I'm not one for the uh, courtroom dramas, but this is the (laughs) one with that really good Klingon lawyer, if you recall. Oh, the really good Klingon lawyer. Yeah, they, um, like con- that goaded Worf into punching him in the courtroom to say, see, he's violent and that's why he destroyed yeah. those guys. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Uh, the, act- the actor was a good actor. I'm looking at his face now. Um, yeah, it's a pretty good episode. Yes. You know, hey, it's memorable. Next was Hard Time, episode 18, which was another O'Brien Must Suffer episode. I think season three had like four of those. This one only has one or two. O'Brien tries to reintegrate to life on the station after serving 20 years in a virtual prison. This was a good episode. Yeah, it was crazy, like, you know, damaged psyche kind of stuff. And the thought of like, hey, he was only gone 20 minutes, but he served 20 years in his mind. And yeah. he's just messed up. It's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant idea. I remember this episode. This was a great episode. 
-hmm. it's funny how they use different pictures on the icon for an episode when you look it up and this episode when you look it up has my picture on the icon and i'm always looking at like uh, this is not a Jake episode. I might have been in, but this is like a Miles O'Brien, you know, this is his story. Very much, yeah. And um, uh, Echar was the alien that he ended up killing, Echar. Uh, Echar, yeah. Um, but the thing I remember about this episode was just, it was just great because essentially just the idea of implanting a 20 year, you know, sentence. Uh, in your mind you know it, it leaves you with the feeling and the uh, the memories of, of, of having done this hard time even though you weren't there and I, I think that's a great concept just in general to to deal with it in this episode mm -hmm. and by the way our guest that day was writer producer robert hewitt wolf and he's been great to our show he's joined oh, us he's several awesome. times absolutely love him he's got an amazing memory for these kind of details and so he joined us for that one very happy to have him uh next yeah. will be episode 19 shattered mirror but we will do that during the free-for-all because it is just about time to go to that before we go we would like to give a very special thanks to our friends Homer Frizzell in Walter Koenig's former apartment building in New York City, I guess. Dr. Anne-Marie <laughs> Seagull, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet TJ, Skillet. Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Tim Baum, a.k.a. Grandpa One, Bill Victor Arukin, uh, Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, John Mann, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Anna Post, Tierney C. Diekman, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat, Erica Strom, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DeQ, and Neil Q. Akasaka. Lastly, please do not forget very special thanks to Dr. Susan V. Gruner. V. Gruner. The insect lady, the entomologist. Thank you all very much for joining us. Stick around for the free for all right now. And until then, always remember the seventh rule. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the seventh rule. Got a little bark, a dog barking action in the house. Uh, we're going to finish our review on season four. And joining us is going to be Dr. Susan B. Gruner. Rocking the hair today. Beautiful. And we also have Melissa Longo in the house. Hi. The kind merchandise. The Ken Mitchell one. All right. Nice. Beautiful. Uh, Eve England representing Abyssinian Kiosk in the house. There she is. Um, we also have the board queen herself, Tierney C. Diekman representing with the mugs <laughs> <laughs> and all the way from Missouri, Mr. TJ Jackson Bay. Oh, that's where the party came from. I was inspired. <laughs> all right. And everybody also knows. we have Ryan Yeah, I'm Mr. Ryan Tiosk and everybody knows okay. that is Ciroc. P. Lofton, everybody. So, oh, right. yeah. No one is to love him. The P is silent. The P is silent. <laughs> He's like, did you get that, Ryan? The P is silent. So, <laughs> you're really uh, slow and out of the bowl. So, here we go. Um, next is episode 19 of Deep Space Nine Shattered Mirror. When the mirror universe counterpart of Cisco's deceased wife lures Jake to the other side. Ah, Cisco must follow and help the Terran resistance against the Alliance forces. This one actually affected me more than I expected it to and more than I remember it because, man, Jake's mom is dead. Yeah. And he sees a universe in which she's still alive, even though she doesn't know him or remember him. I mean, who, who, I'm, I'd be powerless against that. Uh, you remember that one, Ciroc? Yeah, 
Of course. And we've got Jennifer Cisco back in this episode. Yeah. Um, and, you know, she's always going to feel like mom to me. So that's yeah. how it felt from the beginning. And working with her again was kind of that same feeling all over again. So, yeah, this episode does have that emotional pull at your heart because Jake is longing to have certain kind of experiences and emotional connections to, connections with his mom. He's longing for the conversations and getting to know her and what she likes and, you know, the curiosity that we would all have if we didn't get to spend those kinds of moments with our, mm-hmm. with our mother. So I think this is a great episode. Certainly worth a another viewing for everybody at home because it just, I don't know, it really hit different the most recent time I, I watched it. I just really felt for Jake Cisco. How, how can you fight that if you see your deceased mother alive again in a different universe? Who's gonna be who's gonna be able to resist that and just do whatever it takes to stay with her and be around her? Um, okay. The uh, next episode, episode 20 was oh another jake cisco jake cisco is dominating season four here with <laughs> I don't know the muse <laughs> a mysterious woman approaches jake to find his future as a writer uh wait approaches jake about his future as a writer odo promises to do whatever it takes to help luoxana troy keep her baby over the father's wishes even if it means marrying her himself Great stuff with uh, Odo and uh, Luoxana Troy and that storyline there. But yeah. Ciroc, this is a pretty, uh, I remember you, you, you said you were a little trepidatious when you, you knew this day would come where you'd kind of have to have some adult scenes, especially who expected okay. to be with Meg Foster, right? <laughs> right. Uh, Meg Foster, you, and she has the unforgettable eyes that are just yeah. like pierced through your soul, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and that's just something she's naturally born with. And on top of that, she has a very uh, mysterious kind of allure to her um, personality and her being. So, um, yeah, I was I was nervous before meeting Meg Foster and before knowing that she was going to be the one playing this particular role. Yeah. I was just nervous with the idea of once again this is another Jake centric episode. Um, and the way it was originally written, I I recall them having love scenes in this episode, or at least a love scene, which they which they toned back and scaled back from. So. I'm glad they did because it made me less nervous. I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> what about, you know, who is this? I got to be, you know, we're in the bed in the sea. We're in the bed. <laughs> kind of a big deal for me at that time. And, um, but Meg was very gracious. And um, um, I remember writing going on every time we would film a scene and I'd have to go and write something in that journal mm-hmm. I I don't like it when people are not writing, so I'd actually be writing something. It wouldn't it wouldn't make any sense, but I'd actually be writing something so that it would you know would look real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, her eyes, like you mentioned before, she had all that makeup all over her, but the eyes were just so piercing. Uh, and yeah. she, she played that role beautifully. It was a strange episode and it's one that I still can't fully get my, you know, wrap my head around it and really appreciate it for what it is. But, uh, I can certainly appreciate <laughs> if I were in your <laughs> shoes, Sirach, I would be a little nervous and uncomfortable <laughs> leading up to that as well, especially yeah. when you find out who is actually portraying that role. But uh, the next episode continues along with the Cisco plot lines. It is episode 21, For the Cause. And this is such a great one. Cisco must face betrayal when evidence surfaces the Cassidy is smuggling for the Maquis. Meanwhile, Garrick makes acquaintance with Zial. Man, talk about Meg Foster rubbing Jake (laughs) Cisco's head, (laughs) you know, to 18 year old. Then you got Garrick kind of giving goo goo eyes to Zial, but 
the big part of that story, sorry, Eve, Eve is like, I just, I, I refuse to even hear this. <laughs> but it was weird. But the big story I thought was Cisco and Cassidy. That was so powerful, especially at the end when he realizes the situation. Yeah, looks like Cassidy got caught up and she's a little <laughs> rebel herself. Yep. And, um, you know, this was this was when we find out, you know, that she's up Eddington. to other things. Yeah. Eddington's and I think she's betrayal. Was was it, it in this episode? Eddington's okay. betrayal. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, because he sets her up so he can cover up what he's doing. Yeah, we yeah. find out that Eddington mm. is a scoundrel. Mm. Yeah, it's a double she, betrayal. She's like mm-hmm. a perfect scapegoat for him to right. use as a distraction for Cisco. And well, she's not well, just a scapegoat. Mm-hmm. She did actually betray Cisco. She right. really did right. do it. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, not right. scapegoat. Like, yeah, you, you know. Right. Right. Sorry, I shouldn't come to that. that as hard down on Cassidy but for some reason we're like that that's more shocking to me than the Eddington thing because well uh, she was doing it out of kindness Eddington betrayed uniform (laughs) he's probably doing it out of what he believes is kindness as well yeah no but she's delivering medical supplies and and he's saving people that have been mistreated by the Cardassians maybe he doesn't have to be a dick about it Exactly. <laughs> I thought he was nice. Yeah. I thought he was. I think we got a nice little debate no. about this. He's oh, a goodness. dick. <laughs> Wait, no, actually, no. The debate's already over. The Lappy Awards, the 2022 Lappy Awards, the biggest, most shocking betrayal was Michael Eddington. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Yeah. All right. This debate is over, uh, and nobody can ever discuss it ever again. Sadly. Ever. <laughs> yeah, uh, Plus, Sue, we can't hear you. Your 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 audio is muted, Sue. Yeah, still can't hear you. But while we're working on that, and but the good news is that Star Trek fans don't like to debate Star Trek stuff over and over again. Once something's settled, we move on. <laughs> we don't. We don't, yeah, we don't create need entire <laughs> yeah right ideologies sure. for anything that didn't exist prior. No. <laughs> No. So and then debate them. But you know, I do remember that Cassidy was uh stand up about just stepping up and eating her responsibility and like, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever the consequences that I have to face, I'm gonna face it head on. She didn't kind of she didn't try to run from it or yeah. lie her way out of the situation. She kind of faced the, the music once it started to play. Mm-hmm. Cisco took it pretty well. I don't know if I'd take it that well. Yeah. Uh, so next is to the death. A renegade group of Jem'Hadar plunders Deep Space Nine. Cisco agrees to combat to a combat operation with loyal Jem'Hadar to prevent the renegades completing a planetary gateway. Another uh, directorial episode by Labar Burton. Um, help me out with this one, guys. Which one is this? I don't remember. I remember Clarence Williams as Omega Klon. Way you yeah, and then we gateway. yeah we discovered that the Wayuns are clones basically because they kill the yes. this for questioning, um, you know, mm-hmm. their loyalty. <laughs> Straight up, yeah. just murder him. Yeah. This but, is the one where they team up with the Gem yes. Hadar to yeah right. They have the Gem Hadar on the defiant with them or whatever. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> For and Chief Miles Edward O'Brien is like, I'm Chief I Miles Edward O'Brien. Yes. Yeah. I'm very much alive. And, I that way. and then the jo- one Gemini <laughs> asks Jadzia how old she is. <laughs> she says, I stopped counting after 300. He's like, 300. <laughs> okay. Good one. Good one. Okay. Sirac, any thoughts on that before we move on to the quickening? No, let's quicken it up. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Uh, okay so the quickening Bashir tries to help a planet in the grips of a dominion engineered plague that guarantees painful death oh right good one uh directed by Rene Aubergenois uh this is an oh wait did we have Sid for this one 
Uh, no, but we did have you guys, Dr. Muhammad Noor join us because this is definitely someone that would help us and explain all of this cool biological stuff. Cause what do I know? Do you remember this one, Sirach? I do. Um, I remember them getting that kind of, they had that disease that was like causing them to get zombified. Mm -hmm. And, and he was, uh, Bashir was working on some kind of way to fix it and Mm -hmm. then reverse the process of it. Yeah. I remember it. Mm -hmm. A lot of hard decisions to be made there. And this attendant guy was a problem if I remember correctly. Uh, but yeah, fun one, interesting one. Uh, next was episode 24, Body Parts. Quark hears on Ferenginar he is going to die. Rom convinces him to sell his remains. After an accident, Bashir has to move Keiko's baby to Kira's womb. Directed by, again, Avery Brooks. Soraki had such a big knowing nod when I said uh, uh, Keiko's baby gets transferred over to Kira. Yeah, um, that was a big storyline that lasted for a while. You know, Kira carrying the O'Brien's baby. So that was a lot of um, the beginning of a lot. And mm-hmm. I also remember Quark selling his body parts. I thought that was funny, too. <laughs> that, that, that whole yep. story. <laughs> and Grand Negus, fake Grand Negus Rom in that episode, right? Who right. was the first Negus? Right. Glint or Grint? What, Gint? What was it? Gint, I think. Gint. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me check real quick. Um, quick scroll. E- no, it just says as ROM on IMDb. But yeah, I think you played like Gint or something like that, right? Okay. So the final episode of season four is Broken Link. Odo is suddenly struck by illness. He's barely able to hold shape. Bashir and Odo see no other alternative than going to the founders. And Garrick wants to come along because he's weird. Um, so, so broken link, Sirach. What do you think? Find... He wants to find what? I don't remember why Garrick came along. Um, he wants to find uh, an offering, Tane. Oh, okay, right. What okay. happened with that works. the Cardassians? I mean, mm-hmm. that works. Uh, you remember this, Srog? So, this is when uh, Odo gets all, but he's like getting all like burnt and crusty and weird, messy. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I don't remember too much of it, but I, 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 I think this is the beginning of Odo kind of like getting weird on us. <laughs> well, no, it, it was uh when the founders made him a solid after yeah. it, it it was his judgment his punishment after killing right. another changeling mm-hmm. and so which they finally was, decided yeah exactly which is why it was entitled broken link that's right that's kind of like their their final they they severed him from the link and made him a solid because mm-hmm. they're mean Mm-hmm. Oh, that's why he became weird. He's just like <laughs> they the did it to him. <laughs> He's just like the <laughs> All right, very and, unique, just like everyone else. And that's Les Landau, of course, yeah. everybody's favorite. Uh, but it is a really crazy and interesting way to end season four because, you know, that's that's a shocker. He's no longer. Is that the one? where it oh. ends with him just like naked and like shivering on that little island, right? No, it ends with him going back to the station and him saying, Gowron's a changeling. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's before yes. that. that he's shivering and doing the just, hand of David yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then after that, he says that he got some things that they were trying to hide from him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good, yeah, very good. Okay. Well, let's just open it up and talk about season four as a whole Um, in general. And everybody knows what's coming right now. Eve England out in Wales. Can you please give us 
two of your favorite episodes of season four, as well as an episode that you think, you know, it doesn't get enough love or that uh, is kind of underrated. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just such a dark earth season, isn't it? I just feel that, you know, you've got all this betrayal, all this paranoia just throughout the whole thing after being set up at the end of season three. Um, so I'm actually going to pick out of, I'm not going to pick some of the obvious ones. We've obviously got some of the great episodes and some of the character ones with, you know, Hard Time, The Visitor. But I think I'm going to pick my two favourites in terms of what I really enjoy are Armand Man Bashir and The Little Green Men. Wow. So they're just my favourite. I just love those. And they're just the ones I just go back to because they're just... That, you know they, they stand out in this season because they are sort of snippets of joy whereas everything else is pretty dark and gloomy and pretty dire in most cases so I think they're my two favorite if I had to pick so I'll leave all of the other ones to somebody else to talk about um but I was kind of thinking because I, I knew you were going to ask this Ryan so I was thinking of okay which one do I think is an underrated one and then I was thinking okay from a personal perspective obviously I love the cat so for me <laughs> yes you do <laughs> Yeah, so I was thinking, okay, actually, this is a really big season for him and his development as a character. So, and I was trying to think of whether it's going to be indiscretion or the second word, return to grace. So I think it's kind of, it's probably two of those together because they kind of fit together. Um, so we, this is where we really see the potential other side to Descartes. To so where he, for a short period of time, you know, steps away and you think, oh, he could actually be something other than this evil character that we've seen. But then we find, you know, obviously later on, he just reverts back to that sort of evil side of his. But we kind of see this potential in him where he turns into a pirate, he commandeers a Klingon ship. And I just, you know, think that that's just, it's the start then of that bigger story arc to where we end up getting to with Descartes sort of later on and, and what happens. So I think it's not one of my, they're not my favorite episodes, but I think in terms of their importance of the overarching story, I think are really important. And also obviously in Return to Grace, we do get introduced to Damar, who is yeah. really fundamental. Jesus. So yeah, so that <laughs> me is a pretty big thing. Cause I just- Good knowledge. His character's awesome. When, and when you look back, when you know what, what happens to him and where he goes from there, when he's just this innocuous character in that one episode, I just think that's, it's really fascinating rewatching it. So, mm -hmm. so I will pick Return to Grace as the underestimated or overlooked one sometimes. Return yeah. to Grace. Uh, right, yeah, Damar was initially just this character that's supposed to say like, yes, sir, firing torpedoes or whatever. They just needed like, mm. I think he even didn't have a name. I think he was just like Cardassian officer or something like that in that first episode, something. Uh, oh, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, Melissa Longo and her Be Kind shirt. Uh, your thoughts? You have a couple favorites and an episode that you think just doesn't get enough love. Um, yes. Um, Little Green Men. <laughs> wow, Little Green one. Men is dominating so far. Uh, I was gonna <laughs> choose. <laughs> choose Armand Bashir as well oh, sorry. but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna copy Eve <laughs> um because I would have chosen the visitor as well oh. but that's kind of obvious uh an obvious choice um because it's so good but a second one a second favorite no I'm gonna go with those two <laughs> even though they're obvious those are my favorites the visitor and little green men mm -hmm. and then um and i was trying to decide between rejoined and starship down as um two that don't get enough love i like starship down mm -hmm. because it was the negotiation between quark and the gamma love quadrant it. alien was amazing and then I also like how how Kira and Cisco's relationship grows in that episode too and at the end she's like hot dogs what are those <laughs> <laughs> and then <laughs> of course rejoined is is kind of an, an important episode where it, it it visits taboos you know of um Jadzia rekindling something with a former host mm -hmm. so I like yeah. that one. It's and remember one. at the very end of uh, Starship Down, uh, Cisco gives Kira that baseball hat and she flashes yes! that beautiful Nana yeah. visitor smile with it. Yes. Love it. 
Yeah. Okay. Dr. Susan V. Gruner, your hair is amazing as always. It's <laughs> hardcore purple. Jake Sisko would be proud. Do you have a, a couple of, a couple of favorite episodes and maybe one that you think, you know, it's kind of underrated. Oh, whoops. You're still muted. Oh, no. We can't hear you, Sue. Try, uh, maybe just try logging out and coming back in, and then we'll see in a minute. See if that helps. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> all right. So we will move over to Tierney C. Diekman. Do you have a couple favorite episodes and maybe one that you think you guessed it, is underrated. <laughs> well, um, I mean, there's the obvious. Uh, the, the Visitor and Little Green Man. I mean, you can't not with wow. those two. I mean, come on. They're so good. I rewatched uh, both of them and was loving Little Green Man the entire time. And I teared up at The Visitor again. How, how can you not? Um, I did actually have a question though for Sirak. Um, excuse my dog; he's at the window, whining. If you can do <laughs> both strange. Wait, hang on one second. Sue, sound check. Oh, nuts! No, no. no. Keep keep no. pushing buttons and fiddling with stuff while uh, Tierney okay. asks Sirak. Um, Sirak, how how did you feel about them bringing? Tony Todd and someone else to play you as opposed to you for an episode? Um, I mean, I wanted to do it originally. I mean, in, in the beginning, I was excited about the prospect of playing the old me. Um, but we, we did go through a makeup uh, test and uh, it was pretty obvious that I wasn't wasn't going to be able to it pull wasn't it off. Working. No, I, mean, I was like 18 years old and trying to look 80. <laughs> and I, 18 going on 80. Yeah. 80. And can I you did, hear me now? I, yes, yes, we did it, Sue. We did it. <laughs> now he can hear you. So yeah, it was just not going to work. I, I barely, you know, was starting to look like an adult. <laughs> so to try to try to look like an old man would be really a stretch. Uh, even with Michael Westmore's amazing makeup department, uh, they couldn't perform a miracle. We needed Moses to help me out. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, but no, I, I, I tried. I went there, went to Rick Berman's, did the whole little uh, spiel. And he just kind of like laughed, shook his head. It was like, nah, which we all knew. You know, the mirror told me that. But then Tony Todd was hired and he started to um, spend time on the set and just, you know, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to watch you. I'm just going to spend time looking at you and paying attention. Don't mind me. You know, I'll be studying you. So. Once I saw it was Tony Todd, I was like, all right, you know, I was already aware of him from Candyman, obviously. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to argue with Candyman. So they got the right guy. <laughs> I'm not going to put up a fight. Mm -hmm. And I thought he did a fantastic job. So um, the energy and the synergy worked. Uh, Avery was the bridge between that, between us. You know, he was able to uh, transpose his feelings for Jake, me, onto Tony Todd. And that worked just as much as Tony Todd trying to portray me, uh, Avery being able to uh, make that connection for himself and made that more believable as well. So that added to the believability of the whole thing. So yeah, everybody kind of stepped in and did their thing and I'm, I'm happy and pleased with the results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
That is awesome. I'm, I was on mute. My dog is absolutely losing it because we have Your Amazon. dog loves the visitor. That's why. <laughs> He's still just losing it. So um, I don't know if I can trust Wouldn't him be the first quiet. dog to bark at the visitor. Hey. <laughs> He's barking at Amazon, delivering, subscribe, and save. I don't know if I can keep him quiet. There Did you give us your uh, underrated episode too? Okay. He's not done. Well, <laughs> maybe we should switch back to Sue while we can hear her. Okay. So well, uh, you can Dr. come back. Susan V. Gruner, your audio is back on and sounding great. And when I said we did it, we meant you did it. Uh, so, do you have a couple favorite episodes and maybe uh, one that you think is underrated? I think they're all underrated. I looked at the IMDb scores and I was astounded. It really pissed me yeah. off. <laughs> Get them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, of course, The Visitor. Um, I wrote down more than three. Uh, Rejoin, Little Green Men, The Quickening, Broken Link, Rules of Engagement. Those are, well, and The Visitor, those are my faves. And uh, in general, I thought the season was awesome. We learned a lot about everybody. It really, the whole cast really gelled, I think, in this season. And uh, I feel like there's I a have, little. That's all I have to say about that. I feel like that. there's <laughs> something a little more juicy in there. Do you have Want one? Juicy? Do you have one episode that you think just above all the others is underrated? Like that, just that you you were just the most shocked. Yes, by I do. It. Yeah. The Muse. Oh wow. Um, underrated by this panel too except for tyranny but <laughs> eve's like what are you talking about Sue <laughs> that was a nod <laughs> so creepy it was oh. creepy but it deserved a better score have you seen the score yeah no it's definitely underrated <laughs> yeah don't even get me going I liked it. But we like when you get you going. Great job. I don't know. <laughs> this is what actors do, but you're with a, how much older was she than you? Is she? Oh, uh, she's at least at that time by 25 years, I would say about 20, yeah. 25 years. You deserve years. an A for that acting that you did. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And Thank a 9.7 rating. On this. <laughs> heck with them <laughs> yeah. so she's 74 <gasps> yeah. so she's about right. so she's about 30 years older than you at the time 30 years older yeah yeah, yeah. and they were going to have a scene with you two in, Good in work, it together Sarah. in a bed is that what you said yeah, yeah oh that's like, that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> now you're starting to see what I was, I was like I'm 18, and this is not possible. <laughs> she, she's almost 50, right? I was like, I can't. I, I, I couldn't. It was like, I was, I was very nervous about the idea. I was nervous about kissing a girl that was like my first Davo girlfriend, and she was like just like six years old. The entomologist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and she wasn't that much older than me, but, you know, when you're young, people being older than you is a big deal it's like uh like you're like oh he's in fifth grade you know and you're in fourth grade it's like yeah. literally <laughs> one grade older than you but because they're in fifth you know what i mean they're like oh he's a senior so even one or two years difference when you're a kid is a huge, huge. deal right it's huge yeah. somebody's like two years older they're two grades ahead of you it's like a big deal um now when you get older and you're in your 30s and 40s it's like you know, it doesn't, like, doesn't you, mean anything. <laughs> right. Hey, maybe but she when, was the first cougar. <laughs> well, yeah. Face cougar. She definitely was. <laughs> yeah, so at that age, when it, when it means so much to you, just one or two years degrees of difference, right, means so much. When somebody says they're 30 years older than you, you're like, what? That's like my grandpa. Like, it looks like <laughs> grandpa. It's like, it's like, you know, that's beyond your even scope of being <laughs> Intimate was but no, that's what you're thinking at that age when you're in your teens. When you're at that age, I get yeah. It. yeah, yeah, when you're in your teens, a 30 year old is well, like, 
a senior citizen to you already like well, because children change so much during their life as mm, kids right. there's so many so many different changes 15 is different than 18 and that's only three years difference so right. there's no. so no wonder it, it seems like a huge difference but when you're an adult it's not that big of a deal because we're not changing as much as children do right from year to year so yeah i I was very nervous about that uh episode and Mm -hmm. thankfully they changed it and i think that's why i probably didn't do as well i think it just it just doesn't fit exactly right no sue gave you a plus acting sorry you that you there you can't do any better than that (laughs) (laughs) that's the rule a plus yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's an interesting story too if you think about it uh you know are you willing to you know put all your eggs in the basket now and and shine and you know go out or you know do you just kind of you know keep living and hope you make it Speaking of which, TJ, we've got to hear from yeah. you, man. Do you yeah, have okay. a couple favorite episodes and uh, an underrated episode? You guys, let's all guess TJ's two favorite episodes. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's I'm, not gonna happen. I'm thinking the not visitor is going to be one. All times, I think it's another one. That's obvious. So I'm, I'm not going to pick it. So exactly, it. Well, you can't <laughs> not pick your yeah. favorite episode for a favorite episode question. <laughs> He's like, I can do what I want. I'm the party gorn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you guys have any guesses? I think hard no, times. I want to hear TJ. Okay. Uh, well, uh, one of my favorites is Shattered Mirror. I'm a big fan of Felicia Bell as Jennifer Cisco. Uh, it's one of my favorite episodes uh, of all time. I, truly sympathize with uh, the journey that Jake went through in that episode, but also the journey that Jennifer went through because, Mm -hmm. um, you know, just recently, you know, in in the review we were looking at when she first came onto the stage, just kind of this ice queen privileged (laughs) Taryn that, and, and, you know, so she makes a little bit of growth there and then she comes back in this episode and, and her heart melts because she meets this young man that, that just absolutely adores her, and uh, and you know, it's, it just will just will do you know anything to be in her company because, uh, be, and she begins to feel kind of that motherly affection to the point that she actually sacrifices her life for him. Yeah. So uh, not something she would have done when we met her. Uh, so I really appreciate you know the story of Mir- Mira Jennifer uh, Cisco. So that's one of my favorite episodes. Uh, the visitor is obvious, so I'm not going to pick that one. I'm going to pick rules of engagement. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I know. That's one of my favorite episodes, too. Uh, this kind of story about this court, you know, battle about um, Wharf. Uh, I enjoyed, I think, the, the, the actor that came on uh, to play the, the Klingon representative did an excellent job. Um, and oh, I forget her name, but. Uh, the judge lady was awesome also. Oh, she was like um, a Vulcan or something, wasn't she? Yeah. yeah. But uh, the episode itself, I enjoyed the story. I enjoyed, you know, seeing all of the different angles that they tell the story from to actually figure out what happened on the Defiant. Um, and, you know, Worf got some character character growth in there. But, you know, it was also kind of fun watching this this kind of verbal debate uh, this verbal sparring, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, which one was it? Uh, yeah, I think the Klingon or, or Captain Cisco. One of them was like, "Yeah, step onto my battlefield." Like, yeah, yeah, my, <laughs> yeah, my territory now. You know, come, come on in. Are you, are you willing <laughs> to fight here? Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, it's kind of a different kind of Star Trek episode, but I like it. The, I like uh, the punch in the face too of that guy. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Vulcan's name was Admiral Talara, and it was played by Deborah Strang. Yeah. <laughs> so we found the guy that likes the uh, courtroom dramas. It's TJ. Yeah. TJ, well, do, you have, do you have an underrated <laughs> episode? Underrated episode, uh, I would say, is a session. 
uh, which is, you know, the story where this guy comes out of the wormhole claiming yep. to be the emissary. Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. I like that episode because, uh, you know, Cisco's always kind of fought with this idea of being the emissary versus being a Starfleet officer. And after this episode, he doesn't have that question anymore because he's forced to face that in a way that he hadn't been forced to face it before. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, mm -hmm. I love that episode. I love any episode that forces someone to kind of go inside themselves and see what they're really made of. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, in the heat of battle or, right. you know, in some, you know, grandiose situation. It's just, you know, stop and think, you know, who am I, you know, and what am I doing here? That's the story mm -hmm. I like. Mm -hmm. And it's relevant today. Yeah. That mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Great stuff, TJ. Uh, Tierney, did we yeah. get your underrated episode? Uh, no, no. Um, I, I'm i not sure I can pick a specific as far as underrated, though agreeing with Sue, definitely on the muse, at least as far as acting on it. Um, mm -hmm. I was surprised to see how underrated it was on uh, on IMDb. It's it's the travesty, but I, I can see it for story. Just it's very disjointed. Um, it's a little weird, but uh, I I do love parts of it. I love Loxana. I like her and Odo's friendship. And to touch on what I was saying in the last season, I if they did ever bring them together, they wouldn't last but i could see it just breeding this close friendship that i wish they could have brought her mm -hmm. in more in the season um or the, the series but just as far as yeah looking through imdb the whole season seems underrated when we've got mm -hmm. the stakes are super high they've they've risen the stakes so much and we get Worf is an introduction, Joseph Sisko, Zial, Damar, Weyun, and if you want to count him, we get Kiriyoshi introduced as well. We get, okay. a, we get a ton of characters. Um, we get a lot of really, really great episodes, both for the time with, um, ah, crap, what was it called? You know, um, the trail episode. Oh, I can't remember oh, it. Up. Yeah, oh, rejoined. 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 Thank you. Rejoined. Um, and it's, oh yeah, yeah. With the with the trill taboos and Avery did an incredible job with with directing. Um, and then we get that that two parter right in the middle that goes back to Earth and it's very relevant today with what it does. And then we get Robert Foxworth. That his character there with Admiral Layton, and uh, if you're familiar with Enterprise, the Vulcan that he plays, I can't remember the name, in another three-parter, actually, I think it might have been the next three-parter they did next to season twos, he plays nearly the exact same character. He pretty much does the, he, he, Thank you. He does pretty much the exact same thing. And the funny thing is that first episode of that multi-part starts with an explosion at a conference. Like it's the same thing over again. And I remember screaming at the screen last time I watched one of the last times I watched through Enterprise. Like, this is the same freaking thing, but um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's done differently, but it's just kind of funny to know that it's the same, uh, the same guy. And then, you know, there is a part that I didn't realize until today or yesterday when I watched it that was addressed in one of those episodes of that two parter that uh, when Martok, I believe, is already taken over and um, he's able to pass, you know, the thing style blood screenings uh, that Joseph Sisko, uh, you know. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, says that if he was a changeling, he would essentially just find some drifter that nobody would miss and suck up all their blood and let it out on cue. What did Q do to him? Uh, <laughs> if I don't react to Ryan, you think he'll stop? Doubt it. <laughs> oh. No, I don't think so. But, but I don't but, think that works for changelings because yeah. Odo 
when he said that he was a changeling, tried to drink liquid, but it went right through him. So he can't hold on to the liquid. Yeah. So mm. I'm not, I'm not sure how that works, but it was just one of those things that it's like, is that the explanation they're giving for how um, the Martok changeling at that point is passing the blood screenings on DS9? Cause he's already been replaced by the, when he's on DS9 in the earlier part of the season because by the end Odo's been told in the link by the changelings that it's Gowron even though we find out later that I don't know how much we want to spoiler if we've got Explorer. that mm -hmm. no you know, spoiler but, um, season you know, four some, so something maybe to look into a little bit more lore wise oh, yeah. on how how changelings are passing those blood screenings. Is is that what they're doing? And I don't think it's ever explained then also how Leighton faked Cisco's blood screening in reverse, that he definitely had some changeling goo. Like, did they somehow sample Odo without him knowing? Yeah. He was getting shot 13 mm -hmm. times and keep some of his goo to also let out on Q during his mm -hmm. during Cisco's blood screening. Like there's yeah. some Anakin plot holes there. Yeah, but 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 Odo did go through medical screenings on uh, through Federation. Right, right, right. Federation. Odo Guys, is, we're but, gonna have to stop it right but, there. Yeah. Very sorry. We're gonna have to leave this mystery for another time because we are <laughs> way over time here. Uh, it, but I think we got an underrated episode out of those. Um, Sirak, do you have very quickly speed of light? Do you have a couple favorite episodes and an underrated one? Um, well, yeah, mine favorites, obviously the, the visitor love that episode. Mm -hmm. Um, another favorite of mine is hard time. I like O'Brien's mm -hmm. performance in this episode. Mm -hmm. I like the concept of doing time without doing time. Mm -hmm. if we, you know, if we could figure a way to do that, that I'm sure, uh, it'd be a lot less, demanding on people who actually have to do time, but still leaving you with the trauma yeah. of it. Um, uh, so I think it's a great episode. And my underrated episode is Homefront, actually. I just like the idea of seeing the Cisco's back at home. I like the idea of uh, Nog being at the restaurant and talking to, you know... The, the Cisco family and making his plea to uh, join into, I think, Red, Red Squad, Squad or something. Yeah, like, that's where we got introduced to Red Squad. Mm -hmm. To Tierney's point, that's kind of another character that was introduced in seasons four. Mm -hmm. Season four. Right. So, yeah, that's my little sleeper, Red mm -hmm. Squad and Home Front. I love uh, seeing the Real at home. quick, I'd say mine are probably The Visitor. It's just so much better. The, the, as time goes on, it continues to get better for me. And The Way of the Warrior, I think, has the most great scenes and great quotes in it of any, uh, almost any Star Trek episode. But a third one, which is also, I guess, my dark horse, is uh, Starship Down. Extremely memorable for me ever since I saw it when I was a kid. Just every single scene, all these different plots that are all very memorable and they all burn images in your head of, Kira praying over Cisco and, mm -hmm. and Dax and Bashir stuck together and especially Quark and James Cromwell doing their thing and pulling mm -hmm. out the, the torpedo. And uh, what was the fourth one? Oh, and then of course, Worf and O'Brien trying to, trying to say win one for the Gipper to those uh, engineer guys. <laughs> but uh, <Yeah. laughs> you do have to move on everybody. We'd like to give a special thanks out to Eve England, Melissa Longo, Tierney C. Diekman, TJ Jackson Bay, Susan V. Gruner. Uh, season four was amazing. Stay tuned for season five and six and seven, probably, I bet. And until next time, Sorok and I and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg would like to remind you to always remember the seventh rule. <laughs>